Welcome, Dr. Fried, and thank you so much for joining us on this ASP chat. My pleasure. Just to remind everyone, Dr. Fried, are the former director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and commissioner for the New York City Health Department. Now, as the president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, an initiative to prevent epidemics and cardiovascular disease, we are very happy to have you here to get into the many recent developments surrounding COVID. But first, I'd like to start with a very basic question that I believe is on a lot of people's minds these days. What does controlling the virus look like? Is COVID ever going to disappear completely, or is this just now a permanent part of our lives, like the cold or flu? Well, the fact is, we can't say with certainty what the future is going to hold. But we can say that there's a lot we can do to make it have less control over our lives. The first thing we can do is get vaccinated. The next thing we can do is make sure that when there is COVID spreading, we're wearing masks in indoor spaces when we may be exposing others. And the third thing that we can do is avoid super spreading, avoid those events that serve as accelerators and give a boost to the virus. Is there a disconnect in the medical community over boosters? The fact is that truth is complicated and there's still a lot we don't know about COVID. For one thing, if you have an immune suppressing condition, you're on high dose steroids, you have an organ transplant, you have certain medical conditions, there's already broad consensus that you should get a third dose of the vaccine. That's not a booster, that's a third dose. What we really don't know yet is, does immunity wane? uh, Or is Delta just a more vigorous virus that's harder for the vaccine to control? And In either case, it's likely that people over the age of 65 or who are medically vulnerable may need a third dose to be adequately protected. But it's unfortunate that we haven't scaled up manufacturing of vaccines globally because uh, there are too many people all over the world who don't have access to even a first effective dose of a vaccine. The head of the WHO has suggested it is unfair to supply booster shots when some undeveloped countries are still in shortages for their own initial dosage. So should Americans and other developed nations wait to distribute these booster shots until the rest of the world receives their first round of vaccinations? This is sometimes called vaccine nationalism. And I think the plain truth is that vaccine nationalism is both ethically inexcusable and politically inevitable. And that's why I think the bottom line is we need more vaccines. So we don't have a zero sum situation. So we can vaccinate the vulnerable all over the world while we do whatever makes most sense to protect people in this country as well. The Biden administration recently ordered companies with more than 100 employees to require vaccinations or weekly testing. What's the history or past precedent of requiring vaccinations in the US? We do require vaccinations. Every state requires measles and other vaccinations for kids to go to school. Many nursing homes require their workers to get a flu vaccination because when they do, it's less likely that residents of those nursing homes will die during that flu season. So uh, vaccine mandates are a well-established way of protecting people. I think there's one thing we have to understand. This isn't just about you. When you're not vaccinated, you might ultimately spread the infection and result in death, whether it's in a relative, a grandparent, uh, the checkout person at the supermarket, a healthcare worker, and not just from COVID. But if you require care in the hospital and other people can't get care, whether it's for a burst appendix or for a heart attack, that also has an effect on others. Uh, We like to think that we have uh, total say in what we do, but you know, sometimes what you do affects whether other people can live their lives. Let me just ask you something about that, because I've been hearing this lately as an argument against the vaccine, which is, well, if I can spread COVID anyway, then what does it matter if I get the vaccine, if I can handle it, if I'm young and healthy, does getting the vaccine help deter the spread of COVID at all, or just if you get very ill? Getting the vaccine makes it drastically less likely that you will get severely ill, also makes it much less likely that you'll spread it to others. It doesn't perfectly protect you from from infecting others, and that's why we also recommend masking, among other reasons, Uh, but it's going to make it much less likely for you to die from COVID and much less likely that you will spread COVID to others. So the Los Angeles School Board recently voted to mandate COVID-19 vaccinations for all eligible students over the age of 12. 
Can you tell us what the benefits and risks are for vaccinating young people? And do you feel that counties and states should require vaccines for kids? Definitely. One thing we've learned over the past year is that in-person learning is enormously important. And schools that try to get kids back to school without masks and vaccinations and protocols to improve ventilation and protocols to deal with cases when they occur are likely going to have to close again, as is happening now. That's why I think it is so important that masks and vaccines are widely used by anyone who can. And one way to do that increasingly is to mandate their use. Here's a big question. Do you think, in your opinion, are we nearing the end of the Delta surge or do you anticipate a winter surge? You know, it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future. And the fact is, we are seeing a cresting of cases. They're coming down, but we don't know what the future is going to hold. What I say about COVID is beyond three or four weeks from now, it's a pure guess. And I'd rather not guess. What I'd rather do is make sure that we have everything in place so that we minimize the disruption to our economy, our jobs, our learning, and we minimize the loss of life. We can do that by vaccinating, masking up, increasing ventilation, increasing testing, and support for people who test positive. Some people were initially skeptical about the use of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines due to the use of the mRNA technology. If you could help dive into that technology a little bit, how long has the scientific community been developing this type of vaccine? And what are the other possible applications that it might have in the medical field in general? I understand that people think, wow, maybe this is rushed. Well, it was fast, but it wasn't rushed. mRNA technology has been researched for more than 20 years. It's kind of just in time that we're fortunate that this technology works well for viruses and it might work for influenza. It might work for some other viruses. We'll have to see, but it works extraordinarily well for the virus that causes COVID. You were head of the CDC during the Ebola outbreak in 2014 when the U.S. saw its first case in the country. Now, as someone who has handled infectious disease response for the U.S., how difficult is it to prevent and then eradicate an infectious disease? And what would the world be doing now? What should the world be doing now to prevent future outbreaks? We're all connected. We're all at risk. A disease that emerges somewhere in the world that isn't found and stopped can affect us within a day or two. That's why we've recommended that every country everywhere in the world should be able to find every new health threat within seven days of when it emerges, report it, investigate it, begin control within one day, and implement defined control measures within seven days as well, what we call the 717 target. If the world did that, we would be much safer. In order for that to happen, we're going to have to invest in public health. We're going to have to reduce the risk of accidents where uh, pathogens can be released from a laboratory. We're going to have to reduce the risk that uh, uh, wild wildlife, wild animals are captured for food or other reasons and result in the spread of infections to people. And we're going to have to better understand our relationship with nature, particularly organisms or uh, like bats that uh, have a lot of infections that can spread to people if we don't control that what's called human animal interface better. But fundamentally, what we can do as people is make sure that there are systems all over the world to find outbreaks when they first emerge, stop them quickly and prevent them wherever is possible. And you mentioned disease eradication. I want to just recall that the world has eradicated smallpox and that has saved hundreds of millions of lives. Disease eradication isn't possible for all microbes. It's not possible for COVID at this time. But eradication is the ultimate in both fairness and efficiency because it's forever and for everybody. Dr. Frieden, thank you so much. We really appreciate your insights. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for doing it. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed this ASP chat. Be well, please.